All right, welcome back everybody. And we're still making this game and we are very, very close to having an actual working prototype of our game. There's one thing left to add though, and that is to have an actual collision when our player hits the obstacle. And that's gonna be what we're doing in this tutorial. So it should actually be quite a straightforward tutorial. But that being said, there are a couple of ways to make our player hit the obstacle and execute some code when that happens. I will start doing this in the easiest possible way, just to have it done. But once we're done with this, I'm gonna add a bit more of a complex way of doing this. And the main purpose of that is to show you some more ways on how to connect different scenes with each other and exchange information. Which isn't really necessary for this game, but if you want to go to more complex games, this is a really powerful concept. But for our game, we don't actually need anything too complicated. All we want is that once the player touches an obstacle, we want to run some code. And for now, it is just going to be some code that will end the game, whenever the player touches the obstacle. And all of that can be achieved actually quite easily. All we need is to add a signal to the area to denote that carries the obstacle and tell it that whenever the player enters the area to D, to end the game. So I'm back in Godot now, and here we have the same game we always had. And the only thing I want to do for now is go to the obstacle scene and make sure that we give this thing a signal and tell it to end the game whenever the player has entered this bluish area. And that's actually really easily achieved. All we need is to go to notes, and here we can see all the signals that this area to D can emit. And the one we are going to need is called body entered. And that's basically what it does. When you hover over it, it gives you all the options. It is emitted when a physics body enters. And our player character is a physics body. It's a kinematic 2D. So I double click on it. And now we need to connect it to our main obstacle scene. So effectively what we're doing here is this area to D node is sending a signal to another node whenever something enters. And then the target node runs some code. In this example, area to denote actually sends a signal to itself. But that doesn't really matter because we don't care where the code is being run from. So in our case, the obstacle, whenever a body enters, it sends a signal to itself to tell itself to run some code, which is perfectly fine. So I click on connect. And now we have a place to run some code. And all we really want is to end the game whenever a body has entered. And to end the game, we need to start with get tree and then quit. I think quit is actually quite a straightforward function. All it does is to end the game, but we can't call it immediately because by itself, an area to denote cannot end the game. What we instead need is the tree itself. And let me just open this in the documentation by clicking control and clicking on it. And here in the documentation, it says it returns the scene tree that contains this node. So basically what this get tree does, it returns all of this. And once we have this, it gives us lots of extra functionality that we can use to do lots of cool stuff. One of these things is to end the game. So if you want to end the game, you always need both of these. But that's basically what we need to end the game. So let's run the game. And it should end the game, but it's going to do something else as well that's not exactly desirable. So let me jump over it. And the game has ended, even though the player didn't touch the obstacle at all. So why did that happen? And the reason is actually quite simple. So if I go to my main scene, we can see we have two bodies in here, actually. We have our player and we have the floor. And the problem here is that when we have this signal, body entered, it doesn't care what body has entered. It only cares about that a body has entered. So it doesn't care if it's the player or the floor that has entered. All it cares is that one of these two has entered. And since our floor cannot move at all, our game is basically unplayable. So what we need is some kind of way to make sure that this floor and this obstacle cannot interact with each other whatsoever, that they effectively just ignore each other. And we are going to fix this by using collision layers and masts. Any object in Godot that can collide with anything else has a collision layer and a collision mask. And the collision layer is basically on what layer the object is on. And the collision mast is what it can interact with. 
So effectively, you can have an object on a layer, and then the object on this layer can interact with all of the objects on different masts. And you could even specify if it's able to interact with itself. So imagine you have five different objects on one layer. Can they interact with each other, yes or no? And you can control that as well. And let's visualize our game. We have overall three different kinds of objects. We have the cat, the obstacle, and the floor. The cat needs to be able to interact with both of the other objects so that it can stand on the floor and collide with the obstacles. That one should be straightforward. So it's going to be on the cat layer itself, and it can interact with the obstacle layer and the floor layer. So these are the two masks for that cat. It cannot interact with its own layer though. So if we had two cats, those two cats could not meet each other. Next one is the floor. And the floor is actually the easiest one. It only needs to be on its own layer, but besides that, it doesn't need to have any kind of mask because it doesn't need to interact with anything else. Although the cat can still stand on it because the cat can interact with the floor. But the floor cannot interact with itself, so it just doesn't really do anything. It just exists by itself. It cannot interact with anything, but other layers can interact with it. And then the final one is our obstacle layer. And this one can only interact with the cat layer, but not with itself or with the floor. So it only has one mask. So effectively, the floor and the obstacles are on separate layers that cannot interact with each other whatsoever. And that's gonna be perfect for our game. So let's implement all of that. And here I'm back in my main level scene. And if you look on the right, I already have it open, it's collision. And here we have layers and masts. And you have quite a lot of options. So in the end, you can have about, I think that's 20 in total layers and 20 masts in total. And if you click on here, it gives you all the names. Obviously, if you just have layer one, two, three, and four for a larger game, this is going to be incredibly confusing. But you can simplify this quite a bit by going to project, project settings, and all the way down, so I was already there, we have 2D physics. And don't confuse this with 2D render. They look basically identical, but they do very, very different things. So make sure you're in 2D physics. Otherwise, you could do something else. So in here, we can name our layers. So I have a cat layer, I have a floor layer, and then have an obstacle layer. So these are the three layers that I need. And there's nothing really to confirm it, you just close it. And if I click on it now, it doesn't show up, but that's just the bug in Godot. If I change the scene and come back, now it should show up, exactly. Here we have the three scenes. So here we have the layers, when we look at the mask, they also show up here. So now we have to implement what I talked about earlier. And I will start with the player cat. So our player cat is on the cat layer. That one's working already. And now for the mast, it cannot interact with itself. So no cat, but it can interact with the floor and with the obstacle. So this one's fine. Next one, we have the floor. And the floor is not on the cat layer, it is on the floor layer. And it cannot interact with anything. So it just exists, but by itself it cannot touch anything. So now we already have these two objects, or they are collision layers rather. And now I'm going to obstacle, and here we have obstacle, and for layer, I put it on the obstacle layer, and for mass, it can only touch the cat and nothing else. And when we run the game now, this should actually be working unless I made a mistake. So let's hope I did this right. And yeah, it's working. And let me touch the cat and it's ending. Right, so now we actually have a working game that the obstacle cannot touch the floor. And as long as we manage to jump over the obstacles, our game is working just fine. All right, and this would basically be a working prototype already. But here's the problem. All of this only really works because the game is incredibly simple. So when the player touches an obstacle, all that really happens is that the game ends. But this isn't exactly a realistic scenario. So if you played, let's say, Super Mario or Zelda or really any game, that you want to do something more complex when the player touches any kind of object. So maybe you want the player to lose some health or maybe to get an upgrade or to get a better weapon. But this doesn't really work in our game right now, even on a conceptual level. Because the main problem is that we have our player cat in one scene, and 
the obstacle on another scene. And all the code we are running runs on the obstacle scene. But we want to influence our player if it interacts with something. And if the code runs on a different kind of node, this is going to be incredibly annoying to work with. So what we effectively want is to have code on our player cat and only execute it from there. And this is not only going to make it much easier to maintain, it's also going to be much easier to read later on. So let's just say that if this is a more complex game, you want all of your player code on your actual player cat. You don't want it scattered around in the program in 20 different places. So that you always have to update in the different ways, you always have to make sure you don't miss anything, and it would just be a nightmare if it's scattered around. What you effectively want is that anything that concerns the player is on the player node. Anything that concerns a certain kind of obstacle is on that obstacle node. And in Godot, since we have so many different scenes, this can be a little bit of a headache to work in. But there are lots of ways to work around this. And I'm going to introduce you to two of them that are very, very common. And those are going to be signals with arguments and groups. And those are two different ways to achieve the same outcome, and that is to work across different scenes. So let's start with the first one. That's going to be signals with arguments inside of them. And we have actually seen this one already. So when I come back to obstacles and open this one in code, here we still have our signal. And whenever anything happens, so when body enters, then we want to end the game. So it's kind of like a signal just as before. But there's one difference. This signal has an argument, body inside of them. And this is actually an incredibly powerful addition to signals. Basically what this signal does, that it emits a signal whenever any kind of body has entered this area 2D. So that's what we have used so far. But it can do quite a bit more than that. Basically, not only does it say if a body has entered, but it also gives information on what that body is, and it gives a reference to whatever body has entered. And then we can use that reference to the body to run a method on the body itself. So let me demonstrate this. Let's say on our player cat, let me add a function that I'm going to call end game. And I am just going to take all the code from here and put it in here. So now we have on our player cat some kind of function that can end the game. So now we need to figure out how can we run this function whenever the player has entered the obstacle. And that's actually really easily done because we can use this body to run the method. So all we want is body dot and game. And all we basically tell Godot is that when this body has entered, then we want to run the method end game from that body. And if we are running this now, this should be functionally identical. So let me go in there and our game still ends. So we have the same outcome, but in this case, we have a function on our player cat, not on the obstacle itself. So if our player had some health, this would be a very easy way to influence a variable up here. And also we could run this kind of thing on lots of different kind of obstacles. So let's say you had a Super Mario game. This kind of function could be on 20 different enemies. And you would only need to add this function. This one would always stay the same. So it's much easier to maintain. So this would be one way to solve this kind of problem. But now let's say that maybe you have a much more complex game, let's say like a strategy game. And you want to have a way to run some code on lots of different kinds of objects. So let's say in your strategy game, you have 20 soldiers, 10 riflemen, some kind of dragons, whatever you want to have. And you want to run one function all of them, let's say to upgrade them all. How could that be done? And for this kind of concept, you need groups. And groups actually work really easily. That you just put lots of nodes inside of a group, and then you can tell all the nodes inside of this group to run a method. So in our case, we can put our player into a group and then tell this signal here to just call this group and tell it to run a method on all the members of this group. So first of all, we need to give our player a group. And this can be done by going to node and to groups. And let's say I'm going to give our player the player group. But you could call it really anything. And once you have done that, you see this little icon here that this node is in one group. 
And now we need to use this one to call this group. And this also works in get tree. But this one we use call group. And now we need two things. We need the name of the group and the method we want to call. So I called this group player and end game. It is still the same function from before, this one here, that now we're running this via a group, not via a signal. And yeah, this is basically all it is. If I run the game now, this should still work in just the same way. And let's hope it does. And yeah, there we go. So effectively, now you have a couple of different ways to work across scenes. And yeah, with all of that one done, we have a basic prototype of our game. But the problem is that it still doesn't look very good. So it's very, very bare bone. And we're going to work on that in the next video, where we are going to add a lot of colors and lots of different animations in this to make this look much better. And yeah, I will see you then.